Good evening and welcome to our Bible study. I'm Pastor A.D., Pastor of True Vine, NBC here in Houston, Texas. And I thank you so much for joining us for our Bible study. If you're not subscribed to this channel, please just hit the subscribe button, become a member of this channel. Thank, thank you so much for all your support. Please share this channel with everybody all around the world. We love you so much for all your prayers. We thank you for everything, all your love offers, everything that you're doing for this church. Any way you're supporting this church, we thank you, thank you, thank you. If you want to become a member of this church, please check down in the description box down below and you'll see our information. Just email us and we will get back with you. But thank you so much. Now today in our Bible study, we're talking about don't jeopardize your soul for the love and money. Don't jeopardize, don't jeopardize your soul for the love in money. So don't put your love in money, okay? Don't put your love in money. So don't do that. Don't put that in desire and all of that in money. Everything is in money, in materialistic things. No, that becomes a God. And so, if it, and God said, put nothing before me. So you don't want to put that before God. It's good to want and to have money. Yes, it's good to have. We got to survive, right? But don't put your love in money. Okay, so very, very important that we pay attention to that. And we're coming from the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. Of course, I have an overview, so we want to pray before we get started. And I love you, love you, love you. God, we thank you, God, for everything you're doing in our lives, Lord. Continue to bless us and keep us, Lord. And Lord, help us not to put anything before you, Lord, especially materialistic things, Lord. Please, Lord, but nothing before you. We want to just put you first, Lord, and love you, Lord, in everything we do, dear God. You, you are above every category in our life. We thank you so much, God. And help us, Lord. Help our hearts. Help us be more like you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. So here's the overview of what's going on within this particular chapter. So before we look to the text, let me just back up a little bit and give you a broader perspective on the subject. As I said to you many times in the study of First Timothy, there is about this epistle a certain polemic flavor. OK, that is Paul is correcting issues in the church of Ephesus where Timothy is now laboring. So when he brings up a subject, it is a subject that is being abused in the life of the church. Obviously, looking at verses 6 through 10, we can conclude in Ephesians church that there were some people who were suffering the terrible, tragic results of loving money. That's not, however, isolated just to that church. It's a problem of equal concern in this age as it would be for any church in any age. In terms of what the Bible has to say about this matter of loving money, the scripture is replete with injunctions against loving money of one kind or another. Perhaps the most telling statement in all scripture related to money are the words of our Lord. Where your treasure is there, shall your heart be also. So to put that into a common language, show me where your money is and I'll show you where your affections lie. To make it even more mundane, go through your checkbook and find out what you really care about in life. And you will see it. Go through your bank statement and you will see it. Um, your spiritual life can be measured probably better by what you do with your money, excuse me, than other single things. Experts tell us that the average person thinks about money 50% of his or her waking time. Amazing, isn't it? How to get it, how to keep it, how to save it, how to spend it, how to find it, whatever it might be, we're tremendously occupied with the matter of money. Jesus in saying, <clears throat> where your treasures is, there your heart is also. Tells us that what we do with our money is the measure of our hearts. What should be our attitude toward money? Well, scripture has a lot of things to say about that. First of all, we're not to think that having money is wrong in itself. <clears throat> After all, Proverbs 8.21 says, God said to those who love me, I will fill up their treasures. So one attitude is the attitude that money is wrong, but the Bible does not advocate that. It does not. It does not at all. So it's not wrong to have money, like I said earlier. Secondly, the Bible says that we are not to imagine that we are the sole reason that we have money. In fact, in Deuteronomy, it says in chapter 8 that it is God who gives us the power to get wealth. So in terms of building a sort of biblical attitude toward money, the first thing would be we are not to think that having it, it is having it, it is wrong in itself. No, it's not. And secondly, we are not to think that if we have it, we gained 
it all on our own, apart from the providence of God. Thirdly, scripture teaches that we are not to cling to it against God's will. There are many there may be times when God takes it away from us. He has before in the past, I know in my life. So that certainly happened to Job also. That even happened to the apostles. Peter says in Matthew 19, 27, 30, we have forsaken all and followed you. We are not to cling to it. If in God's will, he wants us to separate us from it. Furthermore, scripture says in, the, in building our attitude about money, we are not to cater to people who have it for some selfish reason. James chapter 2 verse 1, 1 through 10 warns us against being more favor, showing more favor to the rich than we do the poor. The truth is we ought to show more favor to the poor because their need is greater. Scripture also tells us that we are not to find pride in the money that we possess are the things which we can buy. In the very chapter we're looking at, 1 Timothy 6, Verse 17 says, we are not to be high-minded. If we are rich, we are not to be conceited about our riches. Scripture also indicates that we are not to seek riches. We are to seek the kingdom, says Matthew 6, and let God add the rest. Furthermore, Scripture says, we are not to substitute money for trust in God. Verse 17 of chapter 6, again, says that we are not to allow rich people to get away with trusting in uncertain riches rather than a living God. So in putting together some kind of attitude toward money, it's important for us to realize it's not wrong to have it. We're not to think that if we have it, we, we gained it for ourselves, okay? We are not to cling to it. We're to cling to Christ. We're not to cater to people. We have it when we have it. We're not to use it as a source of pride. We're not to seek it, okay? We're not to trust it in the place of God. And I might add further, we're not to hoard it in a selfish way. No, the liberal soul shall be made fat. It says in Proverbs, give said Jesus to in Luke, Luke that's 638, it shall be given unto you. Generosity, okay, generosity, sacrificial generosity should be a mark of every believer. The over, over um, arching principle of for the life of a believer related to his money is not to love it. It's not to love it, not to love it. This is a axiomatic, um, I think it kind of goes with saying that the love of money is the root of all kinds of what? Evil. Root, root, it can, root of all evil. Root kinds of evil. But it, I think through with me for a moment that the term love of money is one word in the Greek is a philagaria. Philagaria. It means affection for silver. Affection for silver. So the idea here is not money, but the love of it. So it's not the money, it's the love of it. What type of love do you have for money? Or is it more love for money than you have for God? What is it? You understand that, don't you? There's nothing inherently wrong with money. Money is very dangerous. It's like a gun. It's like a gun. It, it can be used to kill an animal for food. It can be used to protect you against an invader. Or it can be used to harm somebody or even take a life. It's a dangerous thing. You go around, as it were, with money. You go around with a loaded gun by which you can accomplish good ends or by which you can accomplish disaster. The issue is affection. It's your affection for it. What type of affection do you have for it? What level do you have for money? The issue isn't money. The issue is how you feel about money. The sin here is the sin of greed. Another way to say that is the love of money. Now, he says it is the root, and by that he means the source of all kinds of evil which become the branches, whatever is hanging on them, in metaphorically tree, okay? Excuse me, the root is the love of money, and it produces all kind of evil, okay? What he means is he says that, it, it, that if you love money, there's usually nothing that can stop you in the pursuit of it. And therefore, it leads to all kinds of sins. Yes, it does. This is no kind of evil, frankly. There is no kind of evil that could be imagined which could not be the result of loving money, okay? For the love of money have committed every conceivable sin, every conceivable sin. People who love money in order to get money, they take bribes. They will distort justice. They will manipulate people. They will take advantage of the poor. They will lie. They will cheat. They will extort. They will deceive, steal, rob. They will abuse. They will commit 
every inimaginable sin, fornication, adultery. If you think it, it will gain money for them. They will do it. They will do bodily harm. They will kill for money. They will teach false doctrine for money. Every imaginable, inimaginable thing you can think of, anything flow out of loving money. Because if you are consumed with the love of money, then that's driving. That's the driving force of your life. Okay, that becomes the sin of your life. You will do whatever it takes to get it. Because you want it. If you are consumed with the love of the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, then you will set aside anything that thwarts that. Therefore, your path of righteousness. And you cannot love and you cannot serve both God and money. There's no sin excluded from this list of what people might do from the love of money. So if you can trust, just deal with affection, you've really won the battle. <laughs> So that's what it's about. Thank you for listening to my overview, my soliloquy. It's very important. So if you can deal with that, if you can deal with the affection, whatever the affection is for the love of money, you, you won the battle. Okay? So don't let money be the total love of your life. Don't let it be the type of love of your life that it controls you. Don't do that. So let's look at verse 6 of chapter 6 of 1 Timothy. Let's check it out. Let's see what it's talking about. So, now, godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. So the nature of money love, it, it, it is dangerous because it ignores the true gain. It ignores the true gain. Okay. He says, indeed, it can be translated indeed, well, or but. If you were to use the word indeed, he would be saying, playing off his prior statement, indeed, godliness with contentment is great gain. Or it may be in an in, a, uh, in another way by saying, but as over against a false godliness that doesn't provide any gain. True godliness does provide gain. That's what he's saying. So there is a great gain with true godliness. Okay, when you really have that true godliness, you trust in really in God and he's your number one love, it brings gain, right? By doing that, by trusting in God. What is godliness? That's that very familiar word used in pastorials. And that's eusebia in Greek. It means reverence. Pity, godliness, all those good things that I like to think of as God likeness. Where there is true God likeness with contentment, there is great gain. Now, if all of you want, if all you want is money, <clears throat> you'll never have that because you'll never be content. The genuine great gain comes from true godliness, which is um, inseparably linked to contentment. The word is um, articius. Articius in Greek means self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency, very important. It was used by cynics and Stoics to speak of self-mastery. The person who was unflappable, the, the person who was not moved by circumstance, the person who lived immune to external distraction, obviously, um, obviously to outside troubles, the person who had that most noble of human virtues, the ability not to control his environment, but to properly react to it. That's the idea of that word. It basically means to be sufficient, to seek nothing more, to be content with what you have. And it is a noble human trait. But Paul takes it further and takes that concept and that word and, sac and sanctifies it. Okay, he sanctifies that word. So in 2 Corinthians 3, he talks about our sufficiency, not being in ourselves, but our sufficiency. Verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 3 is of God, he says. Is of God, he says. It's God's sufficiency in us. Later on in chapter 9 of that same epistle, in verse 8, God is able to make all grace about toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound in every good work. And again, emphasizes that our sufficiency is in God. That's where it's found. So that familiar section in Philippians chapter 4 where he says, I know in whatsoever state I am, I have heard, I have learned, I have learned to be content. Okay. I know how to be abased. I know that. I know, I know, but that that's put down. I know how to abound. Okay. He says, I know how to abound no matter what state I am. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I'm instructed to be full, to be hungry, to abound, to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Then down in verse 19, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So Paul sanctifies this idea of contentment by saying it is a God contentment. It is a God type mind contentment. So it is 
a Christ contentment in the sense of the provision of God and provision of Christ bring about bringing about the contentment. It's more than just self mastery. It's more than just some human virtue. Our contentment is related to the sufficiency of God. It's related to the sufficiency of Christ. It's related to the confidence that says, I want to be godly and take whatever God wants me to give. What he, whatever he wants me to give, whatever he wants to give me. I want to live within his sovereign providential will and seek and seek it. Be like him and to, to, to let the other things find their own level. So it's about their relationship with Christ. What kind of relationship do you have with Christ? What are you what are you seeking for Christ? And what are you trying to do in Christ? So it's about being, having a connection in Christ to where you have that type of Christ contentment. You see, that godly contentment. So what Paul is saying to us here is that this message is that if you love money, you really ignore the true gain. If you love money, you're pursuing something you'll never find. So true godliness, on the other hand, brings true gain. Why? Because true godliness produces contentment. In Psalm 107, it is verse 9, it says, Yes, for he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with God with goodness. That what else could anyone ask? No wonder Isaiah chapter 55 says, Why are you pursuing the bread that does not satisfy? Why are you spending money for what isn't even bread? And you your labor for that which does not satisfy. Hearken to diligently unto me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness. So in the in the in other words, why are you pursuing those things which are not the true gain and forfeiting what is the true gain? It is bound up in the nature of money and the love of it that if you pursue it, you will never be satisfied because the love of money and the contentment are mutually exclusive. So it's like the old Roman proverb that said money is like a seawater. The more you drink thirst, uh, the thirstier you get, right? The more you drink, the thirstier you get. So the danger of loving money as to its nature is that it tends to ignore the true gain and happiness that can only be found in true godliness. So let's combine these two verses, verses seven and eight. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. So, for we brought nothing into this world. In the Greek, the word nothing starts the ver with the verse, nothing we brought into the world in its certain and certainly. So you can translate it several different ways. Neither can we carry anything out, right? We brought nothing in and neither can we bring anything out, carry anything out. So it's, it's right. You come into the world naked, okay? Every baby is born stark naked. They don't even have a name tag. They just arrive. They bring nothing in and they take nothing out. Nothing nothing at all, right? Nothing at all. Nothing. They go completely naked. So, and that's just another simple truism. Okay? Naked came I into the world, Job 121 says. And that's exactly the way I'm going out. Naked I came, naked shall I leave. So Ecclesiastes 5 and 15 repeats almost identically the same thought that is here in this verse. Let me just read it to you briefly. Ecclesiastes 5.15, and as he came forth of his out of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. So nothing you work for, you'll take with you. Everything you work for, you'll leave with whoever or just go away. Or whatever you do with it. I don't know, but you're not gonna take it with you. So <coughs> excuse me. So whatever game that you have. Um, made on this earth, you just have to leave it behind. You're taking, you won't take anything with you. Naked you came, naked shall you leave. Now listen, folks, if you spend your life in the love of money, you're pursuing what is the lock into time and space and has no eternal value. You understand that? I mean, it's a whole wasted life. Not one thing did you bring in and not one thing will you take out. As a friend of mine says, you have never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. The Spanish proverb of past years was there are there are no pockets in a straw material possessions are bound by time and space and so that's why jesus in matthew 6 said so pointedly don't do not lay up yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupts thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt where thieves do not break through and steal. And then that truism for where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also, right? 
So please, he says, do not be so foolish as to spend your life putting your fortune into what is going to stay here. No, put your treasures in what? Your heart and your treasures of, of what's above. So it has no eschatological, I'm sorry, eschatological um, significance nor eternal value at all. And that, that principle is repeated so often by our Lord in his teachings in the gospel. So in Mark, it is in chapter 8, of verse, verse 36, chapter 8, verse 36 in Mark. Do you know this passage for what shall it profit a man if he gain a whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, it wouldn't matter if you gain every single thing there was in this world. If you weren't prepared for eternity, it would all be a horrible, horrible, receptive loss. Thirdly, the nature of money, love makes it dangerous because it obscures the simplicity of life. It obscures the simplicity of life. Verse 8, he says, having food and clothes, and it's possible the word for clothes could also embrace the idea of shelter, okay? So the word can refer to that, and this is verse 8 we're talking about now. So if we take it into, into the broadest sense, having nourishment, clothing, shelter, the basic necessities of life, let us be therewith satisfied. Same word in the verb form <clears throat> used in verse 6. In other words, we need to be satisfied with the simplicity of life. Boy, so so life gets so complex, right? If you've been around for a while, you know it gets so complex. And the more, and the more money you have, the more complex it is. It gets, okay? So, right, the uh, <coughs> the less you can enjoy it, because you sit around worrying all the time about what you're going to do and with all this money and on and on, or you spend all your time racing around like a, a maniac from one place to another buying stuff you don't need, stacking it um, on shelves, being a hoarder and hanging in closets, putting it in the garage is absolutely unbelievable. How much we have that is useless. When you think about it, go look at your house and you'll see everything that's, that's just useless. Stuff you don't even use, stuff you don't even wear, stuff you don't even eat, but you just have it just to have it. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't take us anywhere. It doesn't provide anything. It's just something to have. And it really is a uh, barometer on the condition of the heart in so many cases. <coughs> Excuse me. So Paul is not condemning having possessions if God graciously chooses to give give them, right? But what he does condemn is the desire for them rising out of discontentment. I, I tell you, you look around and somebody is going to say to me, well, I don't see you in rags. Well, that's right. God is very good. There have been in my life these people who have been kind and gracious to me to provide things and, and beyond to that, that I need to eke out a bare existence, okay? And, and again, the question is how I deal with this. How do I deal with it? How I use these things? How do I use this for the purpose of God and for the glory of God? And the greater, deeper questions is this, the thing that I spend my life pursuing. And the answer is no. I spend my life pursuing ministry and God keeps giving me um, other things, okay? He blesses me. And, and if that's, that's what he chooses to do, then I guess it's fair to put me in a position to have to be able to demonstrate these things I preach are being worked out in my life. And that's a real test. So it's not that Paul's condemning having possessions. It's not that. He's condemning the desire that rises out of discontentment because you're always discontent. You want more and more and more and more and more. And that's not a godly way. And that becomes your heart. So cultivate a thankful heart. Whatever you have, whatever you don't have, be thankful, which is to say, I recognize God that your providence has put me exactly where I am with what I have and what I have, I don't have. And, and I want you to know I'm really grateful, God. And so that's the way you look at it. I, I'm really grateful, God. Thirdly, discern your needs from your wants. Thirdly, discern, discern your needs from your wants. So whatever you want, discern your needs from your want. So Everything you want, you're not going to get. Just don't do that. Don't try to get everything you want. You just really, what is your needs? What do you need? Okay, think about your needs. Discern your needs from your wants and be honest about that. If you just start asking yourself that question, that will be a tremendous controlling factor on your next trip to the mall. What do you need? What do you really need? Tremendously. 
it's okay to, to spoil yourself sometime, but not all the time. You have that type of mindset that all the time you gotta go and just buy something for yourself. Simply, simple question that could put a tremendous amount of money into the kingdom of the Lord. Another one: Don't buy what you don't need and can't use to make more, to make you more effective in serving Him. And that kind of of what we said originally: Don't buy what you don't need and can't use to make you more effective in serving Him. So you you ask yourself. How will this enhance my ability to serve God? Another, another question that you want to ask yourself, Adam, am I spending less than I make? Okay, or I'm spending more than I make. Please spend less than you make. That's very question. Very good question. And if you want to prioritize and really budget your life, um, please, a very good question to ask, are you spending less than you make? So very important. You would be staggered to find out what a high percentage of people in America regularly spend more than they make and are in debt. They're in debt now. They, 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 they'll never get out of it in their lifetime because their mindset, they're a total prisoner, prisoner to debt. And that's how it is. That's, that's in their heart. And so, and these things like this, practical little things like this, if you can get them working in your mind are going to prevent your life from becoming a complex struggle over money. The joy of life is not what you have. Listen, the joy of life is your relationships, is who you know, is who you love. And just compare when you lose someone you love, you would have gladly traded everything or maybe anything or everything. I should say for the purpose for the person you lost because people are so much value more valuable. Okay, people are so much more valuable. I think I think Jesus, when uh, when he speaks of the true riches, has in his mind has has in mind people. Um, if you can't handle money, why would you? Why would he give you the true riches? Why would he do that if you know you can't handle it? God is very intelligent. He's smart. He don't make any mistakes. He says, so the nature of money, love makes it dangerous because it ignores the true gain. It focuses on the temporal um, and it obscures the simplicity of life. The simple joys of being content with whatever you have and building your life around relationships and honoring God rather than the complexity of attaining riches. So let's look at verse nine. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmless lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So secondly, the second major point in verse nine is found in verse nine. Money love is dangerous, not only because of its nature, that is what inherent to it, but because of its effects. What it does to you, what does money do to you? Think about that. And again, there are three things that I would draw in, to draw to your attention. First of all, verse nine, it leads to sinful entrapment. It leads to a sinful entrapment. But they, but they that will be rich, they that, that they that purpose to be rich, they that decide to be rich is volemia, volemia. They that have a settled rational desire to be rich out of their mind, not out of their emotions, but they have decided they're going to pursue it. To put it all, put it another way, they that are greedy, put it another way, they that love money, they that approach life that way are falling, present, ten, present tense into temptation, okay? They're falling into present tense temptation. Um, it's kind of an over and over situation they, in a snare. They're continually in the process of falling into all kinds of sins and that trap them, that trap them all the time. And so I have seen people who spend their money to eat. They go out and eat and they eat and they eat out and that becomes their fancy. OK, and, and they <clears throat> and they literally cannot, after a period of time, eat at home. They're controlled by this overpowering trap to go out and waste money eating and eating and eating and eating. And much of our eating today has little to do with food and a whole lot of and a whole lot to do with entertainment and environment. And, and so you, you you see these type of people. Um, and they have these strange, bizarre type of sins. People who find it almost impossible to stay at home in the evening and have conversations with their family. They're so compelled all the time to be moving around in, in the fast paced environment of the world. They can't sit and still anymore that they become entrapped and trapped in the materialistic pursuit. And basically is almost irrational. They, that, that the greedy person is 
tempted initially to reach out for what he wants. He reaches out, or she reaches out and steps into the trap. It's it's caught in the trap of sin. And that trap then becomes to make a victim out of the person. And so what happens with the love of money is you love it so much, something allures you, something allures you, something attracts you, and you reach for that something and you're trapped in that complex of situation. So you become a victim of it. It's a trap. And Satan sets that trap and holds you in it as long as he can, as long as he can, possibly can. I'm telling you, he's going to hold you there. Because that's what, that's what he wants, and that's what you're desiring in your heart. So scripture has so much to say about the traps of sin. I don't want to be to, to, to just stick with this issue, but back in Deuteronomy 7, I'm not going to stick on this long, I was reading, and it says, verse 25, chapter 7 of Deuteronomy, verse 25, it says, The carved images of their gods shall burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or the gold that is on them, nor take it until you, lest you be snared therein. So for it is an ab uh, abomination to the Lord, our God. So in other words, stay away from the money, silver, gold, because it captures you. That's what captures, that's what allures you, right? It snares you. You get into a lifestyle, you can't let go of it. You're a victim. You're just so much like tra a trapped animal in a cage. You reach out for the, for the bait and you're caught. Money, love is a trap. Uh, it's a trap and it, 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 it makes people bound slaves to it. So very important. And secondly, not only does it lead to sinful entrapment, but it succumbs to harmful desires. Verse 9, he says, and they also are falling into many foolish and harmful desires. You get involved in love of money and not only will you be trapped, but you will be controlled by your passions, controlled by your desires. He calls them foolish um, epithemia, uh, foolish, evil impulses, is in the sense that they're irrational. Here is this person, like an animal caught in a trap, thrashing all over the place, trying to get free, totally irrational. Moral sense is blurred and burning desire for self-fulfillment and more money. A senseless, rational, illogical, um, animalistic kind of conduct. So they, they become victims of their own lust. And James says in verse four, says in four, um, you desire, Chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. You desire to have, James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. You desire to have and you cannot obtain. So you kill. You, you lust and you want and you can't get. So you make war. In other words, all the violence that comes when you when your passions are restrained by circumstances. So he, so he says, first of all, the love of money is dangerous for obvious reasons that it takes you. It's a sinful trap. Secondly, that once you're trapped, in there, you become a victim of illogical, irrational, animalistic desires, which bring you harm. They are harmful. Blabberous. Blabberous in Greek. Blabberous in Greek. It means injurious. Um, you, you hurt yourself. The opposite of true happiness. Chasing money is not the way to, of happiness. Just think about how many people in Hollywood have, have really uh, committed suicide or are really um, subjugated by depression. Think about that, man, because of the money. It's because of money. They've been chasing money and money don't bring you happiness. That's not the thing because that becomes their life, their lifestyle. And that's not the thing, not for all of them, but, but some of them, it becomes their lifestyle. So it's the way of to being trapped in sin and desire a victim of for your lust, of your lust and a victim of your desires and totally a victim of these evil habits that control you. So loving money leads to sin. So loving money leads to sin. It leads to entrapment. It leads to control by lust that is irrational and only brings self-inflicted harm. And then the final effect, he says in verse 9, withdrawn man and destruction and perdition, these lusts, these evil impulses, it ultimately drown men in judgment. The word drown means just that, to submerge, to drag, to bottom like a sucking ship, uh, the sucking ship. The picture is not of a partial devastation. It's a total devastation. And so that's that's why he chose the word. And, and they just go out of sight. They, they, the ship goes out of sight, right? It totally sinks to the bottom. And so the word destruction is olethros in Greek. So, <clears throat> This word is used very often of the body, the destruction of the body, although it can also be used in a general sense of destruction, as it is in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 3. The word perdition is used, I think, most times of the destruction of the soul. It's used, for example, of the place where the false prophet and the beast are cast into Revelation 17 and 8, in the hell of hells where souls go who do not know God. And 
And what he says is, if we can't put those to get those two get those two together and make a little bit of distinction, we can say that there's a total devastation of body and soul, total judgment. The combination here has the sense of least of complete internal irreversible loss. Okay, you cannot reverse what's been already done by God. So when God puts you to hell, you cannot, you cannot reverse that. It's irreversible. So love of money damns people. Love of money damns people. It plunges them into an ocean of eternal destruction. It total destro totally destroys their life. So when Simon showed his love, showed his love of money in Acts 8, Peter says, your money perish with you. Your money perish, that's what Peter told him. Your money, your money will perish with you. You're in the bond in the bond of iniquity, the gal of bitterness. So in 2 Peter 2 and 7, there's the filthy manner of life of wicked. And if you follow down Peter's destruction description of false teachers, starting at the beginning of chapter of the chapter, we find that they're in it for the money and they're headed for destruction. So all the preachers that's in this for the money, in the preaching for the money, you're in the preaching business for the for saving soul business for the money. Hey, you're headed for destruction if you don't repent. So a filthy manner of life headed for God's inevitable destruction. Verse 10, our last verse for today. Excuse me, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greed in their greediness. And per and pierced and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So, and finally, the danger of money is lastly emphasized by the proof of that danger through the illustration in verse ten. He gives the principle in verse ten: the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and then gives the proof which in antecedent of which is philigora, philigora, the love of money. Okay, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which while some um, coveted after, and now he says there are some living proofs of this, some living illustrations of this, some who reached out after desire, like reach, like stretching forth is the implication, stretching forth is the implication, reaching forward, who really pursued this, like maybe Demas in, in 2 Timothy 4. 10, who love this present world. There are some living illustration of people who passionately pursued money and, and they, and what they, and what did they do? What happened? They eared from the faith. They, they, they ran from the faith. They went away from the faith. Okay. What does that mean? They were led away from the body of Christ of Christian truth. They were led away from the faith. The, the faith wants for all delivered the saints of which Jude writes. They departed from the truth. That's what they did. Money made them depart from the truth. The love of it, the love of that money made them depart from the truth. And it doesn't mean they were saved. It means they had the truth in their presence and it was there and they could see it, but they chose money over God. That's what happened. It doesn't mean they were saved. It means they had the truth in their presence. They heard the truth. They knew the truth. That doesn't mean they received the truth. They didn't receive it, but they heard it. They knew it. But they chose money over God. They departed from the truth. Um, gold replaced God. Their gold, the gold replaced God. Silver replaced God. Money, the green, replaced God. So you can't serve God in money. And they chose money. What does he have in mind? Who are the who are some who are the some who do who did this? Well, I can think of one. He's not named, but he, but he must have been in the thought of Paul. His name was what Judas. Who having loved money, eared from the faith. Remember, the, the, one of the disciples, Jesus' disciples, Judas, who betrayed God over money. So in proximity to Jesus Christ, one of the disciples, and yet he chose over the Son of God. 30 pieces of silver, inconvincible stupidity. So you think that was rational. You think it was smart to choose 30 pieces of silver over against God of the universe? Hmm. But that's the whole point. Foolish lust, foolish impulses, harmful ones, and such who do the ear, <coughs> who do that ear, excuse me, from the faith, secondly, pierce themselves through with many griefs or sorrows. Pierce was originally used of putting animals on a spit, running a skier right through the animal. You know, the thing you turn over the fire. What he is saying is they, skew, they skewed themselves in this. 
They, they just pitched themselves in this. They messed themselves up. They literally ran a spear right through the full left of their whole soul, brought consuming grief, grief from a condemning conscience and un, unfulfilled heart and dissatisfaction and disillusionment. They did all this. Concern, um, certainly Judas was uh, dissatisfied, grieving, disillusional uh, with a condemning conscience and an unfulfilled heart when he went out and, 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 hung them, and hanged himself, right? Remember he hanged himself? Yeah, after portraying Jesus, yes, he did. He pierced himself through believing him, believing me with many, many griefs, and he will be pierced with them forever and ever in hell. That's no way to live. So Paul says this is something that's already been out there for you to see. So some have tried to live after the love of money. They have eared from the true faith, and they have literally skewed them their souls forever. So how should we live as believers in Christ? How should we live? We should live with a pursuit of God, not a pursuit of money. In the words of Psalm 17, 15, David said, I will be satisfied when I wake in thy likeness. So that should be our pursuit. And anything we possesses that we possess in this world is only to be used to bring about advance of one we really love. Okay, of the one we really love. Money love is deadly. It ignores the true gain. It focuses on temporal things, you know. It, it, it obscures the simple joys of life. It leads to simple entrapment. It, it succumbs to harmful lust. It exposes to eternal judgment. How much better to love the, the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's my prayer daily that we'll be honest and upright enough in our spiritual commitment to take the steps that we need to take to divorce ourselves from loving money and reaffirm our love for Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining me. Please don't let money destroy your world, destroy your life, destroy your soul. Please don't let money rule you, rule your heart and govern your heart. Please don't let it do that. Um, but thank you so much. And I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you for those who have that issue that have that issue with money. I'm praying for you. And remember, you got to let that go and come totally to Christ. You got to let that love for the money, the love and money, got to let it go. You got to let it go and really turn your life over to Christ and make him your first love and your only true love. So remember that. Keep that in mind, saints. Until next time, please tune in Friday for the pastoral moment and Sunday for the word of God. I promise you won't be sorry. Please tune in. I love you. I love you again. Share this channel. Like this video. Subscribe to this channel. Please, please, please. Until next time, stay connected to the vine. We are True Vine. True vine. We love you. We, we want to know why? Because we're True Vine and we are the church of love. God bless. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and join our online Christian family. Tithes, offerings, and donations can be made via Cash App at dollar sign TVMBC or by mail at True Vine Missionary Baptist Church, 1407 Grove Street, Houston, Texas, 77020. Thank you so much and have a blessed day.